but with him more than a conqueror. Nothing without you. If you would, if you take out your Bibles. Okay. If you would, if you will join me in the scripture reading, if you'll take out your Bibles and turn to the book of John, in the 11th chapter. We're going to concentrate on one verse today. In the book of John. 11th chapter, verse 35. The entire verse. Amen. I hear some snickers as folk get there and read it with me. Jesus wept. Amen. You may be seated. Jesus wept. For many of us, that was the first verse, bless you, that we ever memorized. Jesus wept. It's short. But it's full of so much meaning. We're going to delve into that on today. Earlier today, young brother Jaden over there said, it's all bad news. Everything is bad news. Today I'm going to talk about some bad news, but eventually we're going to get to the good news. Amen. Amen. I want to reflect back on the World Trade Center. I want to reflect just for a minute on the Murrah building. Oklahoma City, the Las Vegas shootings, the Orlando nightclub tragedy, the Virginia Tech, Sandy Hook, Columbine, and even now Marjorie Stoneman Douglas high school shootings have been added to the list of tragedies. The list of names that fill the obituary columns daily, everywhere. Not just the ones that make the headlines, but we, we try not to notice. We, sometimes you can't help but notice. Sometimes you just have to take a step back and look and see what is going on in this world. And, 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 and some things just make you gasp, and, and, and some things just make you pause and, and take notice. But when tragedy is as big as the New York skyline, when, when, when tragedy comes across our television screens on every channel all at the same time, it, it, it gets hard for us to ignore. It gets hard for us to turn away and turn a blind eye. Uh, there's always that awkward, I just don't know what to say feeling that causes us to send flowers so that we don't have to look our friends and loved ones in the face and come up with the right words to say, 
we go to Hallmark and we buy cards because someone has taken the time to say it better than we can generate the words from within our own selves. But as awkward as it is, perhaps I could entice you one more time to attend with me yet another funeral on this morning. If you will, in your mind's eye, I want to take you back over 2,000 years ago where on a dusty road where the air was hot, it was arid, and it was dusty, but you can't help to notice how unbearable the heat is as it permeates through your feet as you walk along the road that traveled between Jericho and Jerusalem. It wouldn't be so bad, but uh, 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 you were traveling uphill, mm -hmm. going from sea level, traveling up the mountain with every tiring step, the Jericho Road. You hear someone pay, why doesn't someone pay this road? Would make for much easier walking. Another one answers and says, we don't need no Roman road. It seems as if we're going to walk all the way to Jerusalem. As we come to the foot of the Mount of Olives, we stop at a crossroads. You look up almost straight up toward the top of the mountain. Your feet are aching, your calves, your muscles sore. Not sure if you're going to make it. And even if you do make it to the refreshing decline on the other side that leads down into the Kidron Valley, you don't know if you'll be able to make that last little short climb into that great walled city. But here at the crossroad, a cool wave of relief washes over you. And while you're shaking the sand and the rocks and the dust, out of your sandals, you realize that your group leader has taken a turn to the east. Now, away from that horrible climb, but now he has taken another road down, down toward the town of Bethany. For the first time, your mind is off your burning feet, your mind is off your aching calves, and you concentrate on what is going on around you. Not as many Roman soldiers on this road. Not as many foreigners on this road. A, a lot more of your kinsmen, a lot more merchants, a lot more of your family, caravans of families even, and several animals, but even with these, traffic is not as heavy as it was on the Jericho Road. We're not even close enough to the town to hear the bustle of the community when you notice a woman walking quickly toward your company. As she nears, you see her face caked with soot and dust, her clothes rent and torn in the appropriate places in the manner of one who is in mourning. After a brief conversation with your group leader, she re-enters the town only to return shortly with another woman at her side. A brief exchange of words, and now we're heading into Bethany. As we near the tombs, whitewashed in limestone, you can hear flutes and the sounds of songs pouring out from the broken hearts of the grieving. You see faces you recognize. You see friends, relatives, some acquaintances, everyone dotted with ash and dust from head to foot. Everyone wailing with strained voices and tear-soaked faces, but the loudest are the ones you don't recognize. These are the professional mourners. Oh, Lazarus, blessed Lazarus, may you rest in Abraham's bosom. Blessed Lazarus, oh Lazarus. 
it is sobering to say the least as you watch while your own loved ones covered in ash begin beating their chest wailing in gut-wrenching sorrow broken in grief especially mary especially mary her torment gushes from within so powerfully her body heaves in every draining well trembles in every gasp for air but your heart stops as you turn to one side turning directly into the face of Jesus looking full into the tear drenched swollen eyes of God sobbing sobbing in uncontrollable heartbreak as he looks at Mary, a man of sorrow. Acquainted with grief, the sorrowing, suffering Savior, Jesus wept. Now weeping is not just your garden variety shedding of a tear. It, 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 it's not the one where a tear just kind of escapes and rolls down your face inconspicuously. Weeping is when your body shakes from its very core, sobbing with great sorrow when you are tore up from the floor. There can be no mistaking, weeping True weeping. Most of you remember how the story goes. For those who are unfamiliar with it, it has a wonderful ending. Don't get me wrong. Over the top of all those human voices crying out the name of Lazarus, only to the voice of one man do the dead respond. Huh? Only one man, one voice, one authority, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus lives again. Thanks a lot, Jesus. <laughs> what am I supposed to do with this? Mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, relatives, friends of relatives, all grieving, heartbroken. Lord, they've just lost their children. They've just lost a brother or a sister, a mother or father, to a bomb or an assault rifle or a hurricane or a tornado or whatever steals the headlines on that day. All within the safety of a 10-foot chain-link fence where they're supposed to be safe. Parameters of school zones and signs posted, overwatched by dozens of uh, adult supervisors, educators, law enforcement that had taken an oath to serve and protect, frozen with their feet stuck in the mud and the mire, unable to move or unwilling to move to lend assistance. Don't let it go unnoticed that, on, that, 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 that the tragedy at, at, at Stoneman Douglas High School happened. Not only was it Valentine's Day, but it was Ash Wednesday. And I remember as I saw the footage on CNN, of a mother standing outside waiting to get the news, horrified and seeing the ash cross on her forehead. And that's when I realized this, this, this was Ash Wednesday.
The ashes are formed in the shape of a cross and they symbolize penance. No parent should have to suffer through the penance of their child gunned down in a school. Christians, well, Catholics, display the ashes to express penance and faith. People receiving ashes are told, repent and believe in the gospel or remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return. Lord, the tornadoes, hurricanes, and violent storms wreak havoc and will causing carnage at every turn. We just don't have the ability to comprehend it's not within us to have an automatic understanding of all that is going on around us. We're just not made that way. Everything we are spiritually, we find in the person of Jesus Christ. We have to remember that he was all man and all God at the same time. In his spirit, it is his spirit that enables us to bear the name Christians. It is his church. He is the first and the finest teacher, first and best preacher, the greatest pastor. Everything we do is wrapped up in his spirit, his direction, his word, his action. He is the model for every act worthy to be called a Christian. The world around us is suffering, it's crying, it's grieving, it's falling apart in emotional turmoil. We are all falling apart from time to time. The pain is everywhere you look, and everywhere you look is pain. It's all negative, it seems. So we look to the Word of God and to the Gospel of John and say, Lord, how can I help the hurting all around me? Where can I turn when I'm hurting? We do our word search and cleverly uh, find a passage that addresses Jesus at a friend's funeral. Uh -huh. This is what I've been looking for. This is what I need. I'll find some comfort there for sure. It all seems obtainable. It seems believable. It even seems comforting until Jesus changes hats from the suffering Savior to the resurrecting Lord and cries out, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus lived again. Now folks often like to say, what would Jesus do? Hmm? They wear t-shirts and wristbands and, and, and people have made millions of dollars pushing the slogan WWJD. What would Jesus do? And I have said and will continue to say that we don't have to ask what would Jesus do. All we have to do is look to the word of God to see what did Jesus do. Pardon me while I amend the t-shirts and the wristbands as our perfect example sobbed from his belly and cried real tears and then called a man from death to life. Our perfect example. What am I supposed to do with this, Lord? Hmm? What kind of an example is this? For me, what kind of an example is this for your children? I've never raised a man from the dead. I believe it's safe to assume that none of you have either. I'm just asking.
Did he leave us with no model for ministering to the broken, broken, grieving lives around us? Or did he? I believe if we look deeper into this passage, we will find the heart of Christian care bound up in the character of Jesus. Companionship, comfort, and compassion. We don't hear much about it these days. The concept of someone who is the Son of God has been elevated to such a lofty state that we forget that he was also called the Son of Man. In fact, that was his favorite name for himself, the Son of Man. It was his prophetic title. It was a nickname that he picked for, him own, for his own self. He liked that name. Jesus was a man. Human. And more than that, he was a likable person. Jesus was a man that people enjoyed being around. More than just the life of the party, more than just the lawyer or medical doctor with a circle of friends who is bombarded with calls for free advice, Jesus wasn't just the guy you wanted to be around. He was the guy you wanted around you. <laughs> the friendships Jesus fostered kindled hot in the hearts of those who loved him, probably because he loved them first. and better than they could ever hope to reciprocate. If someone offered him bread, he fed 5,000 to their fill. If someone gave him honor, he made them whole. If someone granted him trust, he gave them new life. Is it any wonder we read in verses 3 and 7 and 8, Lord, the one you love is sick. Then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you're going back there? Jesus is saying, I don't care what harm might come to me. It doesn't matter about me. Sounds like what Dr. King said 50 years ago. Huh? Yeah. My friends are in need. My true friends are hurting. I'm going back there. In verse 15 it says, let us go to him. He's saying us because he wants the disciples to come with him. I believe Jesus would have gone alone. I really believe that Otherwise, we wouldn't see the remark of consensus made by Thomas in verse 16, speaking to the rest of the disciples when he said, let us go also, that we may die with him. Now, Thomas was just a beacon of positivity. <laughs> uh, Y'all know about Thomas, you know. He says, yeah, we're all going to die, but if we're going to die, I want to die with you, Jesus. I want to die with you. No one dies for an acquaintance. You won't hear a conversation like this among high school kids. Um, hey, do you remember Bill? Who? Bill. You remember I introduced you to him the other? Oh, yeah, Bill. Yeah, well, he, he died last night uh, drinking and driving. You never hear a kid go, oh, that should have been me. No, nobody dies for just an acquaintance. No one dies for a teacher. When someone reduces Jesus to a great teacher, like that of Confucius or Socrates, uh, we can be quick to point out that Plato never took that poison cup for Socrates. Hmm? But every apostle to the man gave his life for Jesus. 
built into the character of Christ was unconditional companionship, unconditional love, faithful to his friends in the face of danger, even to the death on the cross. So powerful that it forged new friendships, faithful to himself, even to a martyr's death. Jesus, it's suicide to go back there. It's foolish. You're going to get yourself killed. But if you go, we're going to. Intentional friendship is what it was. Ride or die. Huh? Intentional friendship is friendship forged in the fire of commitment. Trustworthy, loyal, committed, faithful to a fault. A promise kept even to your own hurt, disgrace, or disrespect. A vow honored to your own torment. Ask any Marine what sympathy means. Intentional friendship. Intentional friendship is companionship like Christ. Of course, there's more at work here than just good, solid friendship. Thomas, you may remember, was the disciple who needed to see the nail prints in his hands, the wound in his side, before he could believe Jesus was raised from the dead. And before we jump into our tradition of Thomas bashing, remember that doubting Thomas leads us to a very important insight. You see, not only was Thomas willing to follow Jesus into a hailstorm of spite, spit, and stones from the Pharisees because he loved him, ride or die, simplify. But because he knew, just as he did in that upper room, there is comfort in the presence of Jesus. I hope that the families of those at Stoneman Douglas High School and all the other tragedies around the world can find some comfort in Jesus. Martha knew it. She came running to meet Jesus before he had even reached town. Mary knew it too. Martha went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and he is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. When Jesus, uh, when the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to mourn there. Mary had remained in the house when Martha went out to meet Jesus. Mary was the emotional one. After four days, she continued to weep. Four days. It is interesting to note the difference in the two sisters. No one supposed anything about practical, pragmatic Martha when she left the house. Nobody took notice. Just figured she was going to take care of some business in the Martha way of doing things. But when a sobbing, sorrowing, scrambled to her feet and ran out the door, when Mary left, the crowd went with her. They supposed she was going to the grave site. Mary was a mess, tore up. She had tried to find comfort in her brother's final resting place. For four days, she mourned to the point of despair. So when she ran out the door, they assumed that's where she was headed. There is comfort for despair, comfort for the hurting, and Mary knew where she had to go. They supposed she was going to the tomb, but Mary went to Jesus. Never underestimate the power of presence. For the hurting, there is no answer. There are no solutions. It is said suffering sometimes is a mystery. You can no more fix a broken soul with good advice. 
similar experience or excellent intentions, then you can solve an algebra equation by chewing bubble gum. But there is comfort 